Hey everybody, welcome to episode 139 of the Masterclass. My name is Cam Brennan and I am joined by the one and only David Hogue. What's up, man? Ah, uh, well, I think we're going to do um, some follow-up tonight, which is very exciting. We are. It's very, it's been a long time since we've had follow-up <laughs> and uh, I'm excited about it. So uh, do you just want to dive right in and see what happens? Yeah. All right. So uh, new listener, Corey, also my boss, so no pressure here, uh, wrote in uh, after our episode called God Plays Favorites. And, uh, well, here are his thoughts. He said, uh, here are my thoughts on the idea that God plays favorites. Who knows, maybe he really does have favorites, but I don't love that it may imply that we don't all have the opportunity to be his favorite. In my opinion, Deuteronomy 28 is one of many great examples uh, of how to be God's favorite. There is a list of really awesome blessings that you will get if you obey the Lord, and it is followed by a list almost twice as long as really bad curses for when you disobey. So does God have favorites, or does he favor obedience? So let's talk about that, and then we'll go back into the rest of his email. Because I think that's a really interesting question. Does God have favorites, or does he just favor your obedience? Because there is another scripture uh, not coming to me at the moment, the, the reference, but it says that God favors obedience over sacrifice. So, like, obedience is a thing with God, right? Like, he's not wrong about mm-hmm. that. Obedience is something that God puts a lot of value in. So, I've sent the question twice now. David, your thoughts? Well, I guess that's kind of what leads somebody to have a favorite, isn't it? Is that there are certain qualities or certain attributes that stand out, um, that we like, that bring delight to us, cause us, you know, to respond, um, positively towards something. So, uh, to me, I think it's kind of one in the same. Mm -hmm. Um, if we're obedient to God and he then chooses us or, or, you know, is that really any different than him just arbitrarily picking us to be his favorite? Like I have few things in my, I don't think there's anything in my life that I arbitrarily just made a favorite. It's based on qualities or attributes that whatever that favorite thing is, has the thing that comes to my mind is like sports teams, right? Sure. I grew up a Manchester United, Glasgow Rangers and U of M football fan, because that's what my grandpa was. Mm -hmm. And that's who I watched sports with because my dad didn't really care about that stuff back then. Like he would take me to games because I liked it, but he was bored out of his mind, right? Um, so at a young age, I decided, oh, Manchester United is the best soccer team on the planet because my grandpa says so. And they play the game right because my grandpa says so. And I was a Manchester United fan all the way until college. And then I finally decided I'm going to choose my new favorite team based on the things that make sense to me, right? Mm-hmm. The things that I value, the, you know, play style, player's character, coach's character, you know, uh, that sort of stuff, integrity in, in how the, op- the organization is run. And that's not a slam on Manchester. It's just I wanted to pick a new team to root for based on my choices. And so that, I guess, when you say someone has favorites, oftentimes you can think, like oh a teacher like a teacher's pet right and they're always jerks behind the scenes but when the teacher's around they're perfect and so when we say God has favorites there's perhaps that uh, connotation of God just arbitrarily chooses like you said versus someone who obeys and then not earns that status but is given that status based on God acknowledging the uh, obedience and you you ask the question like is there any difference between those two things. And I think there is because one is like, if we can take my sports model, like I arbitrarily chose Manchester United because that's what my grandpa liked. And I liked my grandpa, but see, I would, there was no, I would still say that that there was, there was a reason why you chose them. You didn't just go one day, go, I'm going to root for Manchester United. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, you you respect and you love your grandpa, and so because it was his favorite, you made it. Oh, I see what you're you saying. You made it your favorite, mm-hmm. and they were also pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, and again, so another, you know, and yeah. and and that was key for me. You know, I chose to to root for the White Sox because my dad was a White Sox fan, 
But at a very mm-hmm. critical, formidable stage of my life, which was the 1983 season, I was 12 years old. We had just, we lived in Kansas City for a couple of years where there was a professional baseball team and you could actually go to the game like on a fairly regular basis. Um, yeah, you didn't really have that in Des Moines, did you? No. And, you know, that year, uh, I think they won the division with, I, I don't even remember who was in second place, if it was the Royals or the Twins or who it was, but second place team was like 20 games back. And so the year that I became like a fan, they had a phenomenal season and it just kind of happened to click. And, you know, if the White Sox hadn't had the 83 season and I was living in Kansas City in 85, I think I could have very easily been, you know, persuaded to <laughs> to root for the Royals. Or if you were living in Detroit in 84. Yeah, there you go. American the, League Central. The future, oh, the, no, that was, they were well, AL East. Well, not back then, AL East. I was like, the future AL Central had a, th- a good three-year run there. Um, so while you were talking about that, I had this thought of, okay, I really like this idea that God favors obedience. Like, that seems to track with his character yeah, and his past. and I would agree with that. But, but then I think of situation oh well okay hold on so i think i might have just solved this in my head but i'm gonna say it just for the benefit of sharing it is david right david a man after god's own heart you know the whole david and goliath thing that we've not talked about multiple times i think is a really a better way to view that story than than how we traditionally do but the whole thing with bathsheba right that's not obedience no at all right i mean you're you're obeying something but it's not god right and Yet David is continually blessed, continually blessed. But then I think about the story and that child that came from that murderous affair Mm -hmm. wound up dying, which is tragic and horrible and something that I would never wish on anyone, right? Right. And so clearly it's possible for God to still favor somebody even in their disobedience, yet there will be consequences for that sin. And so it can't just be simply. Do I obey God or not? I have to imagine there were other people that obeyed God during David's time, yet David was chosen to be the king. And that doesn't necessarily mean that he was God's favorite person on earth, but like at that time, in that moment, in that culture, anointing the king to lead God's people was a pretty big deal. And for him to do something as horrible as he did, in having the husband brought home, getting him drunk, trying to send him home so he'd have sex with his wife so he could cover up the fact that uh, just in case she got pregnant after I saw her on the roof and brought her to the, to the castle and probably forced myself upon her. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't work, so I'm just going to kill him, essentially. Send him to the front lines and just hope that the rest works itself out. So how does that work into this whole favoring obedience versus God just choosing someone for an appointed place and time. Like, I don't think God's gonna... And, oh, but here I go again, like, we're all sinners, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like he's choosing the best of us. He's choosing someone for a thing, right? Like, he chose M- Moses to lead the people out of Egypt and to speak, and Moses is like, I'm not a good talker. I don't... Whatever English was then, Arabic, uh, uh, I don't even know what language they spoke. Hebrew... But I, the Egyptians didn't speak that. Like, I don't know. But he doesn't talk that language good. <laughs> <laughs> no. Or well. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. So sometimes it seems like God chooses people in spite of or because of their weaknesses to show his strength, right? Right. I guess I'm talking in circles around this idea of, yeah, God favors obedience, obviously. That's plain and clear as day in the Bible. But I don't necessarily think... And yes, blessings come from obedience, obviously. But I don't necessarily think that just by being obedient does that cause God to say, I'm going to do this crazy thing with you. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. It's happened a lot. Yes. So anyways, you look like you have something to say, so I'm going to shut up. (laughs) All right. So I have a a couple of different thoughts here. Um, I know we started with the whole, so does God favor... Um, have favorites or does he favor obedience? I do want to go back even earlier in that where it says, um, but I don't love that it may imply that we don't all have the opportunity to be his favorite. And so 
I want to clarify something. I am when we, when we're having this conversation about favorites. I am not at all implying that our salvation is dependent on being a favorite of God's. Like salvation, I truly believe salvation is available to everyone. And so that's just one of the first things that I want to go out and kind of say in terms of it, you know, if you're not God's favorite, you can't be saved. You can't have eternal life. And in knowing Corey and having some of these conversations, like we had a whole conversation about open theism over dinner one night mm-hmm. that I think we're, I bought a book, I'm going <laughs> to read it, uh, that he suggested I read, and we'll probably have a whole episode dedicated to that idea because it's very interesting. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. I don't necessarily think that's where Corey's coming from. No, and I, I don't know that Corey's even who I was directing this towards. Just oh, just okay, any, any listener listening to this. That's a my bad, Dave. So... That's that's my I guess the thing I wanted to clarify. And then the other piece of this is is I think when we when we say um you know the favorite I am not saying that your life is easier because you're the favorite. In fact, I think it's Probably harder. I think it's quite the yeah. opposite. So if you're if you are chosen by God or you're a favorite of God, I I would I guess I would kind of say that's the track record is not good of (laughs) like life being easy and so maybe before this is over i need to kind of have a more closed definition of what favorites means but so so those were kind of the the first two things that i wanted to talk about or, or just address before we went much further and then when you talked about king david and being a man after God's own heart, if you look at uh, 1 Samuel 16, that entire uh, chapter of the Bible is about Samuel and him kind of choosing King David uh, at, at, at God's mm-hmm. uh, leading. And verse, so 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so then Jesse, uh, who is King David's dad, um, is calling all of his different sons to pass before Samuel. And it's kind of this series of Samuel kind of going, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Uh, the Lord has not chosen these. And then he kind of says, are all your sons here? And that's when they realize that, you know, King David's the youngest is not there. Sends for him to come get him. And the Lord said, arise and anoint him for he, for this is he. And then he now anoints him. So there's an element of really not even talking about King David's obedience, but his heart. And God saying, he's mm-hmm. got the heart that I'm looking for. And, you know, at this point is relatively young. He's an unknown shepherd to the point that he's not even there when his dad is <laughs> parading his sons <laughs> before Samuel for the Lord to, to pick one. And then after it's like everybody else has not been chosen, it's like, okay, well, go get him. <laughs> we'll see if, you know, he's the one or not. So I, I guess that's where I I just I come from of just seeing this like and and I'm I'm not liking the word favorite so much anymore <laughs> as as it is of just sort of like God chooses certain people for certain things and when we initially spoke about it favorite was the word that I used but he. To me, again, it's just Moses and being put in the basket and sent down the Nile. And then, you know, everything just falling into place for him to kind of be that person. Uh, We talk about Joseph and he has these dreams to the point that it ticks off his brothers. And the dreams are about his brothers and his parents, you know, bowing down to him. I can see why that didn't go over so well. I can see why it didn't go over so well. But again... (laughs) While in the end, he ends up being the second in command in Egypt, he had a very rough road to get to that place. Yeah. And so I don't want to imply that favorites means like this 
unconditional blessing where everything goes your way. And that, that's maybe that's the that's what I uh, I'm not sometimes the best way to define something is, is to say what it's not. And so my definition of favorite is not an unconditional blessing from God. I'm not putting those two words together or those two ideas together. All right. So Corey continues on in his email, which you can email us at super, uh, no, <laughs> at hello at supermegacorp.net. Here are just a few practical examples. Noah must have been God's favorite because he wiped out literally everyone else, right? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Genesis 6 9. Uh, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on the earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. And that's from the uh, New Living Translation. Nope, not a favorite. Literally the last person on earth who was righteous and blameless. <laughs> Uh, that's good. Uh, Abraham entered uh, the covenant with God and became the chosen people. But what do you do with Melchizedek, who lived at the same time as high priest? The Israelites were the chosen people, but I'm sure they didn't feel like they were the favorite when the earth opened up and swallowed them whole. Uh, God sent plagues on them. They spent 400 years in slavery uh, or when they spent 40 years wandering in the desert. Or what about Pharaoh? Surely he wasn't God's favorite. He was uh, God's vessel for wrath, right? Well, when we look at Exodus after plagues 1 through 5, Pharaoh's heart either becomes hard, was hard, or he hardened his own heart. We had a very long talk about Mm -hmm. this as well when we were in Atlanta. Plague 6, God hardens Pharaoh's heart, and after plague 7, Pharaoh was stubborn enough to take care of hardening his own heart again. So did God hate Pharaoh and create him just to destroy him, or did God give him five chances before he decided that it wasn't working? What if Pharaoh would have gone the route of Nineveh and changed the path of Egypt? I think you could go on and on with these examples. I don't think God plays favorites. He gives clear rules, and there are those that are favored. So I think he agrees with us on that point, that there are people that are favored, but he does have clear rules. But to say that God plays favorites to me indicates that there are those that he doesn't really want to love or loves less. If you want to be God's favorite, obey his commands. That got a bit long, Corey. (laughs) He's a good dude. So that's a lot. So we should probably start uh, at the beginning, right? The the whole Noah and the flood business. Mm-hmm. He says that Noah wasn't God's favorite. He was just literally the last person on earth who was righteous and blameless, which I think is an interesting tag to put on someone who isn't Jesus. Yeah. But it's there in the Bible. So, you know, Either I can say the Bible's wrong, or I can say the Bible's right. I'm going to say the Bible's right. I just think it's interesting that those words were used. And that whole flood thing is a bit problematic. How so? I know God can do what he wants when he wants because he wants to, but wiping out every living creature save Noah's family and the two animals from each species that made the ark seems kind of rude. Yeah. I mean, like... I'm cool with it because it happened, and, you know, my opinion of God shouldn't do that probably doesn't matter, but it it is like the one thing in the Bible where I'm like, why? Like, pretty much everything else I can get with, real easy, but the flood to me is like, this seems out of character. And, And then the obvious rebuttal of that is, well, hell exists, so the flood's not so bad now, is it? <laughs> But at the same time, it was almost like, uh, well, I, I done screwed up, so I'm going to wipe the slate clean and start over. And God doesn't strike me as someone who screws up. So like, I just don't know how to feel about it, I guess, is where I'm at. That's currently like the flood to me is, is very, very intriguing. The motivations behind it, the actual execution of it. Like, how bad right. was it? Oh, yeah. Like, in a, like, I know we've talked about this in the past, but, like, how bad was it? I mean, and is it worse than it is now? I would be led to believe so. Now, granted, he said he'd never do it again, so maybe it was, like, you know, 10% of what it is now, or maybe it was 1,000% of, like, I don't know, there's no way to yeah. quantify it, but I just, it's one of those things where I'm, like, I just, like, scratch my head and think. Why did he decide that that was the best way forward? And I don't know. You know, and, and to Corey's point, 
Nope, not a favorite. Literally the last person on earth who was righteous and blameless, <laughs> which is just, I'm laughing because it's, otherwise I'm crying. Like right. Those, <laughs> that's the only way I can. So yeah, I don't know. I'm talking a lot, but I have nothing to say other than well, I and don't it's, know. And it's, so, but it's not just him. It's, it's also his sons and their wives. So he clearly wasn't the only person because. No, but God does have an affinity for families. He chose Abraham, yet Abraham's family became his chosen people, right? Right. So it's not, there's not, there's, there's precedent for God choosing someone and their family receiving the benefits of that. Like he chose David and then David's family benefited. And then Solomon, like, Mm -hmm. you know, Solomon was David's son. And then he was great until he went nutso at the very end. So I guess what, I guess, so what I'm saying is, is. If Noah was truly the only righteous person, and his family wasn't righteous, then he wasn't going to accomplish anything by wiping everybody out but Noah and his family. Because you either get one or two options. Either they were all righteous, and that's why they survived. No, but there's there's got to be people left to make more people. Takes two, Dave. I, 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 I get that, but I guess my argument is, is you have to choose. Either Noah is the only righteous person, and therefore this plan is flawed from the get-go, or Noah wasn't the only righteous person, and his family got included. All right, I'm going to look it up in not the NLT, (laughs) just because now I'm curious. All right, Genesis 6-9 in the English Standard Version. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. So the ESV does not say he was the only one. It just says he was a righteous man and that he was blameless in his generation when compared to those Mm -hmm. around him. And so that muddies the waters, which is exactly (laughs) what we needed, right? (laughs) Sure. Oh, man, the Bible. So then he goes, I mean, I don't, I don't think we have an answer for that other than question marks. Abraham entered the covenant with God and became the chosen people. But what do you do with Melchizedek who lived at the same time as a high priest? I don't, I don't know if I have to do anything with him because wasn't Melchizedek literally the one that never died. Right. He just like walked and vanished. He was no more. So like that feels, that, that feels like a special scenario but again i would say he got some god liked something about him that he never experienced death and why was he different than everybody else in that because he's got an awesome name he does have an awesome name i'm trying to convince my wife to let one of our future children have melchizedek as their middle name and she thinks i'm cruel and unusual (laughs) all right um the israelites were god's chosen people God sent plagues on them. They spent 400 years in slavery, uh, and they spent 40 years wandering in the desert. Yeah, that's not that's not super fun. And and again, that was kind of one of the things that that changed my like maybe saying favorite is not the best word or this idea of an unconditional blessing, mm-hmm. which is not what I was trying to imply in that. But that clearly God chooses some people. You know, just like the New Testament verse of some are for noble purposes and some, you know, ignoble. And we are not all the same in that, in that sense, in terms of what God has for us. And some will play a more central role. And it kind of even goes back to, I can't remember if we had this conversation. <laughs> I think this is part of our conversation prior to put, pushing the record button is this idea of, um, I need to be important. I need to make an important contribution. And I think, yeah, I think absolutely. again, it's kind of our 21st century American mind of when you talk about playing favorites, we kind of go to this place of unmerited favor, kind of, you know, unconditional blessing. And that's, that's really, I guess, not what I was trying to convey. Yeah. Uh, so the Pharaoh part is quite interesting. Again, Ed Betters is getting, he's going to be internet famous, I'm telling you. Not because he's a professor at a university, not because he's written books, 
but because of this podcast day, I'm going to make Ed Metters famous. He wrote a book called Pharaoh and the Hardening of the Heart, which oh, I don't think it's on my bookshelf. I'm embarrassed. So this was the same professor I mentioned last episode where we talked about the problem of evil, and we are supposed to solve it in, in one class period. Um, but we spent a lot of time in that class, or no, a different class, actually, talking about this whole concept of Pharaoh and the hardening of the heart and God's willingness or passivity in allowing this to happen. And Corey's point is, when you look at the story in Exodus, there's five plagues that happen before Pharaoh's heart either became hard, was hard, or he hardened his own heart. So he offers up like the different interpretive options mm-hmm. there, right? And this was part of the discussion we had over some really good Tex-Mex. <laughs> it was so good. Um, I gained like four pounds. It was bad. His point was like, the Bible doesn't say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart until plague six. And Corey's point was like, God gave him one chance. God gave him two chances. He gave him three. He gave him four. He gave him five. And then God finally was like, okay, bro, here's how this is going to go. I hadn't really thought of that necessarily in that way. So God hardens Pharaoh's heart at plague six. Then after plague seven, Pharaoh was stubborn enough to take care of the hardening on his own. So here's the question. Did God hate Pharaoh and create him just to destroy him? Or did God give him five chances before he decided that it wasn't working? I don't think God hates anyone. No, I don't think God hates anyone either. So if we accept the question as is, as these are the two options, right? Did God hate him and create him to destroy him? No. Well, then, yes, God gave him five chances before he decided that it wasn't working. But at the same time, I have to say, God is, oh, I want to say this very carefully, God is very much interested in his own glory, right? Yeah. Is that a safe and fair fair thing to say? Yeah, and I, it, uh, I feel the ability to say, I think that's God's like main purpose is to to glorify himself and that's just such a foreign concept to us because it it well it sounds it sounds a bit arrogant it does sound a bit arrogant but when you are god that's okay <laughs> when you are the almighty all powerful all knowing yeah you, you know but then there's humility within the relationship of the holy spirit you know Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The the father glorifies the son. The son glorifies the spirit. The spirit glorifies God. You know, they're not about glorifying themselves. Yeah. That's, that's the saving grace to me in this whole thing is like, you can read these things with, without a full understanding of what scripture says and think, man, God is just really full of himself. But then you look at how he acts and how he behaves in, in the things and the sacrifices he makes and the grace he shows. and And you're like, oh, okay. I get it. He really is awesome and amazing and totally one of a kind in every way imaginable. Yet, he continues to love these broken people. Yeah. And to show them mercy and show th- and to send his own, like, yeah. So, uh, full picture, God's not bragging, he's stating the truth, and also he's showing mercy and grace at every turn. And that, to me, is what's like, oh, okay, that, that helps me with these sorts of passages, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Understand the, the broader picture that I hope in 10 years I have a much better, like, this is one of those things where it's like, I feel like I have a good grasp on it now, but I so hope that I look in 10 years, look back and go, wow, what an idiot. You had no <laughs> idea. <laughs> yes. Beca- you know, like, that, like, because I'm hoping the Holy Spirit works, you know, and and opens, you know, both my mind and my heart to more of who God is and what that means. Like, that's, that's the goal, right? Otherwise, what are we doing? 139 episodes? Mm-hmm. Like, just wasting people's time. <laughs> so anyways, the question. Did God give him five chances before he decided that it wasn't working? I don't know. That's a total cop-out, I'm going to be honest. I just don't know. Was 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 God's plan the the ten plagues the whole time, regardless of how Pharaoh reacted, or was this like you know a decision tree? If plague one Pharaoh apologizes, we go to the Nineveh thing. Boom, Egypt saved. Everyone's great. Man, glad this didn't go sideways. I don't yeah. know because it didn't happen right. that way. 
And I would like I would like to think that if Pharaoh had said, oh, holy cow, oh my gosh. Yeah, I get it, we're wrong. The Israelites can go free, we'll be fine. Go, like, peace be with you. We're going to set up trade routes and we're going to be, you know, good neighbors. I would like to think that, yeah, that's it. That's the end. Boom. Israelites leave. They go back to Israel and kill a bunch of pagans. They don't spend 40 years in the desert. Like, they're cool with Egypt. There's no issue there. I don't know. I mean, there's president there with, with sure. Nineveh, right? Yep. But there's also president there with Sodom and Gomorrah. So, I, I, I don't know. So, I'm going to go back to the verse that we are actually on, or the chapter that we're on, and that's <laughs> Romans 9, which we just read. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saving the podcast, Dave. And Romans 9 says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, Why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? So in my mind, I mean, Romans nine seventeen basically says, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you. Interesting. And, and again, I just, I think it's this, and I, I, I know I come to a cop out on this, but it's, it's a finite mind trying to understand an infinite God. Yeah. And, and and the reality is, is God very well can do that. He can raise, if his whole purpose for creating Pharaoh and hardening Pharaoh's heart and everything that happened was to bring glory to God, then that was a righteous thing for him to do. And that's hard for us to accept. Yeah, because it means that Pharaoh had no chance. Right. Which goes back to Corey's point of, did he create him just to destroy him? Which is... A question that, can God do that? Yes. Do we want him to? Probably not. Because that's harder to deal with, right? But we're also talking about the same guy who flooded the earth and killed everybody but a family. And so like, it's, we, get to, we get to these really tricky, uncomfortable parts of scripture when we have to really be like, okay, it's super easy to be passionate about God and our faith when we're talking about all the good stuff. Love, mercy, forgiveness, grace. Oh, I get to go be in heaven? You, you know? But you get to, like, these passages, or the She Bears passage, to take mm -hmm. an old-school master class. Like, the stuff that just doesn't necessarily go, yeah, that makes me feel happy and warm and fuzzy on the inside. In fact, quite the opposite, right? This is going to cause me to think quite a bit. In the coming days. The message. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, the same point was made when God said to Pharaoh, I picked you as a bit player in this drama of my salvation power. So, is there a sense of God knowing Pharaoh's character and saying, I'm going to put you... And I, I know that your heart is hardened against me, not because I designed it that way, but because that's just who you are. And I know that's going to be the case. And so the role you're going to play in this drama is you're going to be the Pharaoh that has the plagues. And even after giving five chances, you still continue to defy me. I don't know, because weren't Pharaohs familial, like kings? I don't think they were voted into office. No, but again, it's... it's. I have questions <laughs> <laughs> about a lot of this. Huh, well, that's 40 minutes discussing an email from one person. You know what would be crazy? Hmm. We got more emails from people that we could further discuss these things. Because, like, this is pushing oh, yeah. us, right? This is causing us. This is causing us to think about things in maybe a light that we hadn't considered when we recorded the first episode. And this is pushing back against us, which is super good and healthy. And I know for me is causing me to th think through a lot of, you know, my thought processes and, and what I automatically say, Oh yeah, well that's true because that's what, I, what I've always thought. And, you know, it would just like in a selfish way, getting this sort of feedback oh, is absolutely. good for me. Like in a totally selfish way. 
because it causes me to reflect and consider and, you know, maybe even potentially change my mind on stuff. But like from a show perspective, we just did an entire episode based solely off of one person's response to another episode. That's a totally unique episode in, in the grand scheme of Masterclass, right? What a cool way to change the show and to make it more, you know, interactive. And this is super weird to talk about on the show, but like, we're not a show if people don't listen. And people are listening. No, and, and people are listening. But my point is like, how cool would it be to be able to have these super weird, like, Half the conversations audio, half the conversations text, but like conversations with people that are willing to be like, "Hey, you said this, and I think this. Let's talk about it." Right. That's awesome. Like it's only beneficial, right? I hope so. <laughs> well, and I think it's what God. In- I don't think we're. I don't no, think we're. I think jerks, it's what God. So in- like we're not gonna. Is I th- this to me is the equivalent of working out our faith with fear and trembling. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Like this is these are not just lighthearted conversations. It's like you said, I think about these days later. I continue to wrestle with ideas and because we're limited by, you know, the time of our podcast, I can't always come back to things and say, "Yeah, I've changed my mind on this. Maybe we need to do that. Maybe I need to start writing the things down and 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 revisiting that." Yeah. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to leave with my last verses here. And I'm not going to say any more. So this is Luke 1, 28, like 29 and 30 maybe. Uh, and it says, and he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. I'm trembling with great fear now. <laughs> and that's when she learns that she will conceive a son and she shall call his name Jesus. All right. Well, I think that does it for this 139th edition of the masterclass. Uh, as always show notes are available at super megacorp.net slash masterclass slash one three nine, or in your podcast app of choice, swipe around. I'm sure you'll find them. And uh, right there at near the top of the show notes is where you will find a link to email us your thoughts. And uh, if us dedicating an entire episode to one person's email isn't, you know, clear enough, like we really do respect the time and effort it takes to uh, share your opinions. And we would love to uh, do this sort of thing more often. So uh, don't be shy, write in and, um, you know, we can make this more of a conversation than a, you know, a monologue. So that that's there. Uh, it's hello at supermegacorp.net. And again, thank you so much for listening and for your time. And we hope that whenever you may listen to this episode, that uh, you are in encouraged in your faith and that God is uh, somehow in his, uh, you know, ultimate ability working through uh, just two dudes to help you understand uh, him and scripture and who you are in the light of your salvation uh, a little bit more. And that sounds super heavy and self-important, and that's not what I meant. But anyways, hope you're doing well. And uh, David, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.